Christ comes to redeem and make new. Thanks be to God. Amen. We know Jesus was scolded for embracing the outcasts and hanging out with sinners, but his peace wasn't found in others' approval, but in living out the love of God that claimed and guided him. Friends, may the peace of Christ be with you. Amen. As those in the sanctuary greet each other with Christ's peace, we invite those who are with us virtually to share signs of peace with each other if you are on a platform that enables it. And also at this time, we invite our children worshiping with us to come forward for the children's message. Good morning, guys. It's good to see you all. It's really good to see you. You know, most Sundays, when you come up, there's three of us sitting here, right? There's Pastor Joel and myself, and there's also Miss Janice. But, as you may have heard, Miss Janice isn't with us anymore. And she's gone on, and we are grateful for her and I want you to know that sometimes that happens right sometimes people do move on to new things and we move on to new things as well but that doesn't change the fact that Miss Janess loved you and cared about you and loved being able to be the director of our children's ministry it was very important to her and she cared about her job, and she cared about all of you. And it's important that you know that Miss Janice cares about all of you. And the fact that she's not with us, that can be sad, but at the same time, it doesn't diminish the love that we got to share and the good things that we got to do. It doesn't minimize or take away from the fun that we've had in church school or Camp Beatree or any of the other great opportunities and uh, times that you got to share together. Instead, it's an opportunity to simply give thanks, to give thanks for those good times and to give thanks for that relationship that was so meaningful. So this morning, for our prayer, why don't you repeat after me as we pray in thanks for that relationship. Dear God, we thank you for our time with Miss Janess, for our chance to grow together and serve together. Please bless her and bless us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks so much for coming up, guys. You can go back to your families.
Please join me in our prayer for illumination. Let us pray. As we read the stories of our faith, O oh God, may they awaken us, may they startle us, may they move us, challenge us, and enliven us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In the lectionary, which assigns a reading for us each Sunday, which we've been following most of the time this summer, we are in Mark's Gospel and in chapter 7 of Mark. The lectionary has taken out a few verses in this chapter that we're about to read. We will read verses 1 through 8, 14 to 15, and 21 to 23. Now when the Pharisees and some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around him, they noticed that some of his disciples were eating with defiled hands, that is, without washing them. For the Pharisees and all the Jews did not eat unless they thoroughly washed their hands, thus observing the tradition of the elders. And they do not eat anything from the market unless they wash it. And there are also many other traditions that they observe, the washing of cups, pots, and bronze kettles. So the Pharisees and scribes asked him, why do your disciples not live according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? He said to them, Isaiah prophesied rightly about you hypocrites. As it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. You abandon the commandment of God and hold to human tradition. Then he called the crowd again and said to them, Listen to me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going in can defile. But the things that come out are what defile. For it is from within, from the human heart, that evil intentions come. Fornication, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, envy, slander, pride, folly. All of these things come from within and they defile a person. For the word of God in scripture, the word of God among us, the word of God within us. So we might add, ouch. <laughs> this text might have a bit of a sting to it. It begins with Jesus' most common adversaries, not Roman officials or leaders, but the Pharisees and the scribes, his religious leaders. And since they're often his adversaries, we have been taught to see them as the bad guys in the gospel stories. If we needed a placeholder for religious hypocrites in the Bible, and especially the New Testament, they'd be at the top of the list. And not to say there isn't some truth to that, but there was more to Jesus' religious leaders than the labels we've placed on them. The Pharisees in particular devoted their lives to adhering as faithfully and strictly to their law as possible. And the Jewish law, taken primarily from the first five books of the scriptures, were the rules and practices that structured Jewish life. And while we might hear today's rule and practice of washing hands and say, hey, no big deal, what's, what's the fuss here? The Pharisees understood the law as a gift that was given to them from God, and their responsibility as God's chosen people was to live faithfully with this gift, and to be a witness to their surrounding nations, a witness to what life with God looked like on a practical level. And so the washing of hands had intent to it besides just being a rule to follow. There were sanitary reasons behind it as well, but it was really meant 
to make the mealtime more than just a moment to shovel down food as fast as one could. It was meant to make the mealtime sacred and, and special and set it apart from other times of the day. It was an opportunity to give thanks for the gifts and blessings of God in their lives. It was another way of taking part of the day and welcoming God into it. And communities of faith need these kinds of practices. These kinds of rules and practices have a way of keeping the community together and a way for communities to forge an identity. It's why we have doctrines and creeds and our own practices. They tell us who we are and what it means to practice faith within our tradition. But the other side of rules and practices and doctrines is they can easily become something greater than what they were meant to be. And they can be bowed down to and worshipped. The life that was originally meant to be found within them can quickly be just sucked right out. And that seems to be part of Jesus' frustration in today's story. The original intent of this practice has gone astray. But here's a second danger with rules and practices. When our expression of religion becomes ultra-focused on perfectly keeping the rules, not only is the life-giving intent evaporated, but it's only a matter of time before we will begin to look outside of ourselves and turn our attention to the way in which others are keeping or not keeping those same rules and practices and belief systems. We can start to note the ways in which everyone else doesn't measure up. And this is, and rightly so, One of the primary areas where religion is most often criticized for being judgmental and hypocritical. And there's truth to that criticism. And I, at times, have been at fault as well. I'm not immune to judgment and hypocrisy. But we should also note in today's story that Jesus doesn't condemn the practice of washing hands before meals. He doesn't say it's a waste of time, but he instead urges his disciples and us to be more concerned about our own hearts and our own intentions intentions, than how well others are practicing the faith. And Jesus has some strong words today. And he says it's not what makes its way inside our bodies that is the issue, but what already lies within the human person that then makes its way out out into the world. And as I said in the beginning, we might say, ouch, or jeesh, when hearing his list of evil intentions of the human heart, or, hey, Jesus, I'm a good person. I don't take on a lot of the actions you described, or at least most of them. But to Jesus, the inner workings of the human heart seem to be a mixed bag at best. And he asks his disciples to be honest with all that might lurk within them. And that's hard to do. Because we've been taught since we were young to always make a very clear separation between good and bad. There's there's good guys and there's bad guys. And often not much in between. Throw any action movie on and it's pretty obvious who's the good guy and who's the bad guy. One of the reasons I've always been drawn to the Star Wars movies especially when I was young, was the clean lines that separated good and bad. In the very first Star Wars, Luke Skywalker was the good guy and Darth Vader the bad guy. And who didn't want to be Luke, especially as a kid? He was the the hero who was filled with these great qualities. Darth Vader, 
not so much. The second Star Wars that came out in 1980, The Empire Strikes Back, for my money was and still is the best movie out of all of them. And I welcome respectful debate at the conclusion of today's service. In The Empire Strikes Back, there's this great scene where Luke is on the planet Dagobah being trained by Yoda. And Yoda's teaching him about the power of the dark side and trying to convince him, that, convince Luke that he is not invulnerable to its influence. Yoda encourages Luke to walk into this dark and mysterious area and suddenly, out of nowhere, Darth Vader appears wielding a lightsaber. They battle for a couple of moments and Luke finally strikes Vader down. Vader falls to the ground and in front and the front of his helmet explodes. And as Luke looks down onto Vader, he sees himself within the mask. And it seems that Yoda was trying to say to Luke, "Watch out. You're capable of being seduced by the dark side. Luke might not be as squeaky clean as we think he is. Great scene in a great movie. Star Wars has now dipped into TV shows. And this past summer, they released a show called The Acolyte, which is set roughly 100 years before the movies that depicted Darth Vader as a young boy. And in The Acolyte, the Jedi are at the height of their power. They govern the galaxy and strive in everything they do to bring about peace and justice. And what I appreciated about this show was the way in which the humanity of the Jedi was, was showcased. In their pursuit to help bring about peace and justice, the Acolyte didn't hold back in criticizing some of their actions. Some of the decisions they made were questionable. And at times they neglected the needs of those they were trying to serve. In short, they were portrayed as having a whole lot of good in them, but also some bad. Light and darkness. And after watching the show, you, you might end up missing the, the polarity of the original Star Wars, good and bad, light and dark, it's understandable. I, I still kind of do. But you can appreciate the honesty of a show like The Acolyte. It's a bit more honest and true. And when we hear the list of evil intentions that Jesus shares at the end of today's reading, it's somewhat expected to note which ones we haven't taken on and quickly try and assure ourselves that we are good I didn't do that or that or that. I'm, I'm a good person. And when that happens, we miss an opportunity to look ourselves in the mirror and just be honest. We miss that opportunity to tell the truth. We live in this world where there's clean lines between good guys and bad guys, when in actuality, we've got a mix of both within us. That's what it means to be human. God made us and then gave us the freedom to be both good and bad. And on most days, if I'm honest, when I get to the end of the day and I look back upon it, there's usually areas where I can note good things. And at the same time, areas where I know I could have been better. And so thank God that we have a prayer of confession every Sunday. Because we need it. And we don't want to miss it. We need it every Sunday right at the beginning of the service. It's scripted for us every week and we read it together and not all of it might resonate with you on a given week, but I think we can each find something in that prayer each week that we need to confess. There's something in there for each of us. 
When we get to that moment of silence right after our confession, right before we hear the assurance of grace, I encourage you to let yourself linger there for a bit and be open to what might arise within you. Don't skip that part. When I was a youth director at a church in New Jersey, I often helped lead the confession and assurance of grace in worship. And on two separate occasions, people came up to me after the service and said this in so many words. Joel, nice job leading the confession. Thank you. But when you do, you have a way of rushing right from the confession to the assurance and you leave no time for me to actually confess anything. Slow down a bit. I was impressed. Because I realized they were far better at confession than I was. They were much more comfortable turning their full selves to God than I was. They were more open to telling the, the truth than I was. And as I noticed the ways in which I struggled to be honest and tell the truth, I realized they were most likely going to discover that they were loved, even though they were imperfect human beings, more than I might have been discovering at that time. Because as we know, and thank God for this, confession is never the final chapter or the last word. The last word is always the assurance of grace. And so when we reach that part of the service, soak it in. Relish in it, delight in it, marvel at it, and even let it shock you that we are imperfect and yet still loved and accepted. Because we can't read Jesus' challenging words today outside of the context of God's grace and love. We're already accepted and we don't owe God a thing, despite that in the end we are a bit of a mixed bag. Molly Basket is a United Church of Christ pastor in Berkeley, California, and she says this about the grace of God. God's love for us and regard for us does not depend on our good behavior. There's nothing we can do to earn God's love, nor is there anything we can do to kill God's love for us. I love that last part. Our tradition comes right out of the very beginning of the Protestant tradition, and we so often talk about our inability to earn God's love, but Molly notes, I think very wisely, that our behaviors cannot squash or annihilate God's love. We can't do anything to earn or kill God's love, just simply receive it. And the more we receive it, the more we'll be able to turn ourselves, our full selves, to God. Because here's some of the mystery of grace. There's, there's, kind of, there's kind of the rub of grace. If we're just good, we don't really need it. And the more we can look within ourselves with honesty and humility, which isn't easy, the more grace that is waiting to be experienced. The more we can tell the truth the more we will find ourselves resting more and more in the love of God. The more we accept our imperfection, the deeper layers of grace that will be discovered. And Luke Skywalker, he wasn't perfect either. In the most recent trilogy of Star Wars movies, we find out that he's also very human and I probably now like him even more. Amen. Thank you.
You may be seated. We are grateful, friends, for the ways in which, ways in which your gifts enable and further mission and ministry here at TPC. Who we are as a community of faith does not exist without your generosity, your gifts of time and talent and treasure. As our deacons come around with the offering plates, you'll find four additional ways that you can give online, with the easiest being to give to TPC at the upper right-hand corner of towsonpress.org. As we give, may we give with generosity and give with joy. Friends, this is the joyful feast of our Lord. According to Luke, when our risen Lord was at table with his disciples, he took bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. This is the Lord's table. This is the table where, where all are invited. This is the table where even Judas is offered a seat. This is the table of reconciliation. This is the table of redemption. This is the table where cries of crucify him are met with, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. This is the table where Christ's brokenness makes us whole. This is the table where God provides the food and all we have to do is provide the hunger. The risen Lord invites those who trust in him to share the feast which he has prepared for us. May the God of new life be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to God. Let us give thanks to the God we love. We freely give God thanks and praise. Let us pray. It is our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, O God, creator and ruler of the universe. 
In your wisdom, you made all things and sustained them by your power. You formed us in your image, setting us in this world to love and serve you, to live in peace with your whole creation. When we resisted your love and struck, struggled to trust you, you did not reject us, but still claimed us as your own. You sent prophets to call us back to your way. And then in the fullness of time, out of your great love for the world, you sent Jesus to be one of us, to redeem us and to heal our brokenness. You are holy, O God, and blessed is Jesus Christ, our Lord, Savior and friend. In Jesus, born of Mary, your word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. He lived as one of us, knowing joy as well as sorrow. He healed the sick and fed the hungry. He opened blind eyes and broke bread with outcasts and sinners. He proclaimed the good news of your kingdom to the poor and needy. Dying on the cross, he gave himself for the life of the world. Rising from the grave, he won for us victory over death. Seated at your right hand, he leads us to eternal life. So we praise you that Christ now reigns with you in glory and will come again to make all things new. O God, pour out your spirit upon us and these, your gifts. May we now be for the world the loving, serving, forgiving body of Christ that it so def desperately needs. Send us out in the power of the Spirit to live for others as Christ lived for us. Amen. Jesus gathered with his disciples for his final meal. With them, he took bread and after giving thanks to God, he broke it and he gave it to each of them saying, take and eat. This is my body that I give to you. Do this in memory of me. And in the same way, after they had shared their meal, our Lord took the cup, saying, This cup is the cup of the new covenant, sealed in my blood, shed for the forgiveness of all sin. Drink of this, remembering me. For as the Apostle Paul declared, friends, as often as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we proclaim our Lord's saving death until he comes again. Indeed, these are the gifts of God for you, the people of God. So let us come. And as we approach the table, friends, an elder will be tearing off a piece of bread from the common loaf into your hands, and you may dip it then into the cup. Or for those with allergies or who would simply prefer otherwise, there are allergy-free wafers and individual cups in a plate on the table. You at home are also, again, invited to gather bread and cup of any kind and share in the feast. May our elders please come forward.
having communed with our God and with one another, friends, let us join in our prayerful response. Holy God, we thank you for this feast of grace and life. As we have been served, help us to serve our neighbors. As we have been fed, help us to feed the hungry. As we have been loved, help us to love the world. Because in Christ Jesus, you have loved us. Amen. Now, friends, as we go back out in the world, take these gifts with you. May they remind you that you are God's beloved, as is the world. And may we go out and remind the world that they, too, are God's beloved. And now may the grace of God, the love of Jesus Christ, and the power, the presence of God's Spirit be with us now and forever. Amen. Thank mm-hmm. you.